Well, welcome to um, the NSU webinar. Um, today, I've been tasked with talking about positive psychology and well-being therapy. Um, and I'd like to thank my co-author on this, um, Jody McCrone, who was instrumental in um, setting up some of the ideas. Um, so let's start with a overview of positive psychology. <clears throat> About 40 years ago, there was a group of psychologists who sat down and said, you know, we know a lot about depression. We know a great deal um, about anxiety. We know a lot about psychotic disorders, but what do we know about the other side of being human? What do we know about um, humor? What do we know about happiness? What do we know about love? And the answer was, as psychologists, not much. So Marty Seligman has rightfully um, been credited with starting um, the positive psychology movement. And he really pushed it when he was APA president in the 90s. But as many of you may remember from your introductory courses in psychology, Marty had his first claim to fame with an animal model of depression where um, he taught dogs to be helpless. So he called it learned helplessness. And as many of you may remember, what he did was he was able to shock dogs with a um, electrified floor and there was no way out. So the dogs knew that they just had to sit and bear it until it was over. And when they were given the opportunity um, to leave, when they could have just gotten up and left, the learned helplessness was so strong, they just sat on the um, electrified grid until it was done. So you call that learned helplessness. Now, Marty tells a story, um, which he calls the Nikki phenomenon. His daughter, Nikki, was then five years old. And just parenthetically, by the way, she's now a licensed psychologist. Um, but back then she was five. And um, Marty would be the first one to say that if you look at his body of work, um, very little of it has to do with children. He leaves that to his colleagues. And he said, I have children and I love them. Um, but he usually said he, he can't wait until they're adults when he could talk to them. So Marty tells the story of he was working out in the garden and he was weeding and his daughter Nikki came up and said, daddy, what you doing? And he said, I'm working on the garden, I'm pulling weeds. She said, can I help? And he said, he took a deep breath, he sighed and he said, yes, you can help, but no playing. You can help, um, but see these things, these are weeds. We pull them up, we put them in a bag, all right? And this is work. So if you wanna help me, you gotta work. She said, okay. So she's pulling weeds. And those of you who know and love five-year-olds know that it lasted for about three to four minutes. And about the fifth minute, she had mommy weeds and daddy weeds and they were dancing and they get married and they have baby weeds. And Marty is looking at this and he gets exasperated. And he said, Nikki, I told you we're working. And if you're not working, I can't use you and you could leave. So she left. She's also a Seligman. So she comes back a couple of minutes later and she looks up at her father and she said, daddy, I have to talk to you. And he's a sucker for a direct request. He said, sure. And she said, daddy, from the time I was two until I turned five, I whined every single day. And when I had to go to kindergarten, I decided that I'm too old to whine and I'm gonna stop. And daddy, it was the hardest thing I had to do my whole young life. And if I could stop whining, you could stop being such a grouch. And he, she walked away. Well, Marty took that to heart and 
um, he didn't want to only be known for the guy who, um, who tortures dogs. So <clears throat> he began to think that if you can teach dogs to be helpless, and if people can be taught to be helpless, maybe they can learn optimism. And that set him on his road um, to exploring positive psychology. And Marty was excellent and continues to be a huge proponent. He's at the University of Pennsylvania now um, <clears throat> and continues to encourage people to learn more about the positive aspects of um, humanity. Now, at the same time, Carol Riff, who was and continues to be the director of the Center of Aging at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Carol was working with um, old people and she quickly learned that some oldsters are just like, they were bunked on the head with the wand of wisdom. They, they're full of wisdom and you wanna be with them and they're just delightful. And there are other people who are nothing but grumps. So she began to wonder what's the difference? It had nothing to do with um, how healthy they were because there were people who were healthy and wonderful, people were healthy and grumpy. Didn't matter how sick they were. Some people were sick and grumpy. Some people were sick and wonderful. So she began to ask what was going on. Now, <clears throat> If you'd like some nice overviews on positive psychology. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I have no conflicts of interest. I have interests and I have conflicts, but I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, and I wish I had a stake in these books, but I don't. Um, the one on your left by Sonia Leo Bomersky is The How of Happiness. Sonia has written probably about 350 articles um, on positive psychology. And she was able to um, write this wonderful book um, where the first third of the book um, summarizes what is known from the literature. What is the evidence base? Um, and then she spends the next two thirds of the book on evidence-based interventions that increase your happiness. So a very, very good book. Um, I um, recommend it in my positive psych class. The one on your right is by Shane Lopez, and um, he and his um, people have worked on really clarifying what's meant by hope. And the teaser for that is he says, you have hope when you have an identifiable goal, you have pathways to the goal, and you have what he and his colleagues call agency, which is akin to self-efficacy. So it's how do you make hope happen in your life? To excellent overviews of what positive psych is about. If we continue with the overview, um, one way of thinking about positive psychology is if you think about on the left, you have a disease model, right? And on the right, you have a health model. Much of healthcare in general in America, but certainly psychology, is focused on the left side um, of this continuum. It's how do we fight um, negative diagnoses and how do we eliminate them? And healthcare in general is now looking at how they can promote health. But since we're talking about psychology today, um, the positive psych movement has said, okay, you know, if you have someone who's depressed, and you eliminate their depression. One way of thinking about it is congratulations, you got them to neutral. What have you done to help them be happy? It's a great question. So if we follow along the lines of Carol Riff, what do we know about happy? What do we know about living the good life? Well, if you go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks 
talked about two different kinds of happiness and well-being, one being eudaimonic and the other one being hedonic. The eudaimonic well-being, um, as it says on the slide, is the efforts and the behaviors um, and the thrust in your life to become constantly more of who you need to be. So you have ideas of self-development, personal growth. Are you becoming more of who you need to be? And Waterman talked about it as the feelings accompanying behavior in the direction of consistent with one's true potential. This is in contrast to the hedonic well-being, which is positive feelings like happiness and contentment. Hedonic well-being is um, if you go out to look, it's Friday. You know, if you go out to dinner with someone you really care about tonight, you have a wonderful meal. That's hedonic well-being. And the data that has been collected um, in the late 20th and in this early part of the 21st century indicates that those existential aspects of eudaimonic well-being are very separate and different than the emotional and personal satisfaction aspects of hedonic well-being. They're both necessary and important, but um, they're separate factors if you factor analyze them. So how do you define happiness? How do you define well-being? Well, now we're getting into some sticky territory. First of all, as you all know, as psychologists, if you can't define a concept, it's hard to wrap your mind around. It. So somebody who had a lot of time, I think, um, looked at all of the how-to books uh, being sold on Amazon and explored them and found that 90 to 95% of them don't have a database. They're value laden. They're judgmental. You know, so it's like, you know what you need to be happy? You need to be in a monogamous, long term, one on one relationship that's full of trust. If you don't have that, you have nothing. Right? It's like nothing else is important except marriage. Another book is going to say, no, no, no. You know what you need? You need to be happy. You need a diet that helps you move your bowels and that's clean, right? It, it, it's, those things are important, but it doesn't give you the bigger picture. So with contradictory definitions um, that are uh, judgmental based and experiential, this of course led to contradictory findings. There are a number of psychologists over the years who have attempted to move from a generic value-laden happiness to defining well-being. Um, here are some of the previous theories. This is a slide from Carol Riff. So it's a lot, you know, it's kind of like a who's who um, of psychology. We all know Abe Maslow and Carl Rogers. Um, and then you have Alport, um, you have Eric Erickson, Viktor Frankl. Um, Carl Jung, and then some people that are not as well known, like Yehoda, who talked about what are the characteristics of well being, and she wrote back in the 50s, as well as others. But these were all kind of separate and, but equal. So, what the research has found going um, from the eudaimonic to the hedonic is if you drill do, down and do factor analysis, eudaimonic well-being um, has these factors that break down in it. Purpose in life, personal growth, and we'll talk about each one of these. Environmental mastery, self-acceptance, and autonomy. And the hedonic aspects tend to be happiness, positive affect, and life satisfaction. Carol Riff in 1989, pull together all of these disparate conceptualizations and models. She factor analyzed all of them and came up with a valid and reliable data set. And the factor analysis showed six different aspects of well-being. 
So here are her six factors. Um, they all interrelate and affect one another. She's also found, if you delve into the um, midlife in the US database, the Midas database, um, so thousands and thousands of people who participated. And one of the things she found, um, as well as others, because it's free access to the database, is that the relative importance of each one or um, each set of these changes as we get older, all right? Um, so for example, self-acceptance tends to be higher in older adults. But let's get into what she means by each one of them. So self-acceptance, she understands as the capacity to both identify and accept your own strengths and weaknesses. In, in other words, accepting yourself for who you are, accepting yourself for who you're not, knowing who you could be, and knowing who you will never be, and being comfortable with it. Second purpose in life, goals and objectives that give your life meaning and direction. What gets you out of bed in the morning? And by the way, she talks eloquently about how purpose in life does not have to be you're gonna get a cure for cancer. Purpose in life could be that your goal in life is to make the perfect cheesecake with no cracks. That's fine. They have the most beautiful garden you could possibly have because you love flowers. Personal growth is the feeling that you're becoming more of who you need to be than you used to be. You're on a trajectory that's helping you to be who you need to be. The other one, fourth, positive relationships with others. You have close valued connections with people you deeply care about and people who care about you. Environmental mastery being able to manage the demands of everyday life. This one, by the way, has become even more critical um, during a pandemic. And then autonomy. Autonomy, she means it in the existential um, sense of you're following your personal convictions, even when they go against society's um, usual and customary. So those are the six factors. She took it a step further though. She developed the psychological well-being questionnaire, which has been used extensively. And by the way, unlike other people, she doesn't charge for it. You just send her an email, say you want it, she'll send it to you. It's available open access. And the only thing she asks is that if you get some neat data, please send it to her because she wants to know, you know what people are doing. So it's a structured self-report instrument that measures all six constructs. Um, it has uh, initially was tested on 321 men and women. It's since been expanded. But the test retest reliability coefficients for the short uh, form are excellent and also showed good validity with analysis of overlap with other instruments and shows the relationship between the distinct factors. It's a really good um, instrument. So now, now that we have a really valid and reliable instrument that could measure well-being, now you can start to do research. So since 1989, there have been well over 350 publications in 150 scientific journals, and the findings are extremely intriguing. Um, shows how well people navigate their world, as I said, it's most criti more critical during the pandemic because you have disruptions in medical services, disruptions in social connections, increased risk of anxiety and depression. The newest data are sobering. The newest da data have shown that um, the rates of anxiety and depression are four times what they were pre-pandemic in 2019. There are also correlates to well-being connected to hypertension, 
that's the um, if you have a deficit of well-being, <clears throat> and it's symmetrical. If you have high well-being, um, you tend to reverse hypertension. Um, same as the correlations with cardiovascular disease, obesity, and cognitive decline. But again, be careful. Um, it's only correlations, and you don't want to move to causation. We don't have the data yet. But more findings. We all know that the negative emotions have deleterious effects on the body. Um, those of you who are into psychocardiology um, know about that's the embodiment of the biopsychosocial model and the psychosocial aspects of our lives deeply affect our biology and vice versa. Chronic anger and anxiety, the old type A personality and heart disease negatively impacts car cardiac function. Right? So what they found is that it is indeed true that the opposite of this, when you engender higher well-being, then you have all kinds of positive effects on your life, on your experience of your life, and on your physical well-being. So one of the things that the body of research has shown is that there is a very strong and nearly perfect inverse relationship between positive and negative affective states, right? When one is high, the other one is low. And that makes sense, but as one of my mentors once told me, um, and I'll clean it up for you because he was a bit um, on the blue side. Um, but he said, um, Barry, you can believe whatever you like. You don't know Jack until you have data. So it's nice to have data that show that um, very, very strong negative and positive affects um, are inversely relation, related. Riff and one of her um, compatriots, Singer, also showed that it is the absence of well being, low well being, um, can create conditions of vulnerability to future adversities. And since this is true, they said that if you would like to get to the right side of um, that um, continuum, if you want to engender well being, then recovery has to go beyond alleviating the negative. But you have to do something to engender the positive. Now, it also found that when you assess individuals on the psychological well-being scale, it be can become clear where each person could benefit from an increase in well-being in that area of function. Then you could target each area, theoretically, um, that needs work by using an approach to increase well-being. So the outcome would be to give people an opportunity to view their world through a more balanced lens. In other words, um, at any given time, there are things that are going well in our lives and things are going badly. And in the old Gestalt stuff, whatever you have in the foreground does not eliminate everything else. So if you have those, um, the Gestalt images, the famous ones of the candlestick and the faces, right? When you see the candlestick, the faces haven't disappeared. It's just a matter of what you have in the foreground and what you're putting in the background. And what you want, if you're going to engender the positive, is you want people to be able to appreciate at the same time, which is quite difficult, both the positive and the negative aspects of their lives. Okay, it sounds great. How do you do that? Well, to go back to my mentor, we have some data. So back in 1998, Giovanni Fava found indeed more evidence to support the strong inverse relationship between well being and negative states. Then he asked a great question. He said, okay, as all of you know, the recidivism rates for major depression are huge. As you know, if you had one episode of major depression, there's a 70 to 80% chance you're gonna have a second. If you have a second, 
80 to 90 percent, you had a third. And if you're third, real close to 100 percent, you're going to keep having them. And he said, if we're eliminating depression through, let's say, CBT, through evidence-based approaches, if it's eliminated, why does it keep coming back with that kind of frequency? And he said, okay. Riff and Singer said, maybe it has to do with a deficit of well-being. So he did a brilliant study, series of studies. He took a group of people who were in remission from major depression. So they qualified for nothing in the DSM, um, except depression and remission. And he compared their well-being on Riff's psychological well-being scale to a group of nice, boring people who never um, um, qualified for anything on the DSM. What he found is that the people who are getting over depression had 40%, 40% lower well-being scores. So that's interesting. So then, because they all had already used CBT, he used cognitive behavioral techniques, taught them to increase those factors that they were low on, on the psychological well-being scale. Eight sessions every other week for 30 to 50 minutes. At the end of the eight sessions, pre-post tests found well-being was up and depression was significantly down. So that's cool. But Giovanni being Giovanni, um, I've known Giovanni for a while. Um, six years later, he did all this in Italy and the people in Italy don't move very much. So he found almost the entire original group that had gotten his intervention. Um, and um, what he had done back in the day, six years earlier, is he took the people who were in remission and divided them in half. Half the group got his well-being therapy. Half the group had treatment as usual. Six years later, he gave them the well-being test again, and he looked at their relapse rates. Well, the group that was treatment as usual um, still had 40% less well-being, just like they did six years earlier. And their relapse rates were right um, in line with the literature, they had a little over an 80% relapse rate. The group that had eight sessions of CBT every other week, six years ago, six years earlier, only had a 40% relapse rate. Half. That's remarkable. Oh, yeah, here's a picture of Giovanni. Um, and he invited me to be at the International um, Psychosomatic um, Meeting in Italy. Um, and he's just like that. He is, he is just full of joy. And then you have the short guy with him. Um, in 2017, I want to say, I might be, it might be 2016. And again, I have nothing to do with his book. Um, he published the Manual of Wellbeing Therapy, Treatment Manual and Clinical Applications. It's available on Amazon, it's available a whole bunch of places, um, but if you're interested in knowing how to do it, um, he has a very, very detailed manual. And I'll just um, quickly um, go over some of the more relevant aspects of it, as well as uh, telling you some other things about it. All right, so he talks about it as a structured, directive, problem-oriented approach based on an educational model, which makes total sense and it's predictable because he used CBT, because um, he likes CBT. Um, so, and it has a good evidence base, as you all know. So the development of the sessions starts out with the initial sessions. And he says, these, you only want to have these people identify it as, again, it's people um, um, who've gotten over major depression. 
Um, you want them to be able to identify episodes of well being and being able to do kind of a thought log. What are the situations in which it happens? And he asked people to do his version of a thought log, and I'll show you one in a minute. Um, and the circumstances surrounding the episode and rate their well being on a zero to 100 scale, with, of course, zero being absent and 100 being the most intense that anybody ever had. Now, he found that when you first ask people to do it, they say, I'm never happy, right? Again, because of the Gestalt thing. What's in the foreground is just their unhappiness. Um, and what he does, he tells them that the moments do exist, but they pass by unnoticed. And he wants them to notice them in almost a mindful kind of way. So here's one example that he used. Um, there was an elderly gentleman um, who said that um, this, he's usually depressed, said the situation of feeling well-being is he visited his nephews and they greeted him with enthusiasm and great joy. Feeling well-being, they like me and they care for me. So what are the thoughts and feelings associated with the situation and how intense it was a 40, which for him was pretty damn good because usually he's way below that. Father argues, it's even more important for people who have relatively low well-being to pay greater attention to what he calls the hedonic bookkeeping of their activities. More important um, than people who have higher um, um, well-being. Because again, for them, it passes by unnoticed on, again, what he refers to as the hedonic capacity continuum. <clears throat> When you get to the intermediate sessions, um, so once they recognize um, these fleeting moments of well being and identify the situations, thoughts, and feelings associated with it, um, then you can ask what interrupts the well being. And for the gentleman who um, filled out the earlier example, he said, you know why they greeted with enthusiasm? It's because I brought him presents. So you can see where this is very, very similar to um, a Beck-oriented cognitive behavioral approach. Um, and also you could argue, and, and Fav is very good about giving people um, credit what credits do. So it's also very similar to Albert Ellis's rational emotive therapy. What's the evidence? How do you know, right? So you ask, what turns off that good feeling? What's the evidence? And <clears throat> for this, you want people to self-monitor those moments. And he said, this can be two or three sessions, depending on the motivation and their ability to change sets. Um, and it paves the way for the well-being enhancing strategies. Um, so in the final, kind of sessions, right? So when um, we'll get back to an example, when the gentleman says, well, it's only because I bought presents. You ask, well, what's the evidence for that? What else could be true, right? So you just follow the CBT model. So <clears throat> when you monitor these episodes of well-being, um, it allows both the therapist and the patient to realize the impairments in well-being. What are your thoughts and feelings that are cutting off well-being? What are alternative thoughts and feelings that could fit the situation? What happens when you focus on the alternatives? What are the thoughts and feelings you have then? Right? And in the final sessions, he talks about um, progressively introducing um, the material to the patients. So um, if you want to talk about riff, right? He says you could explain that autonomy is really an internal locus of control. And of course, you use your psychology dictionary to translate that to English. Um, um, your internal locus of control, your independence and your self-determination. Um, or you talk about personal growth 
consisting of being open to new experiences, considering yourself as expanding over time, right? And you want to see and assess and work with the patient's attitudes around the impairments in well being and how open are they to alternative conceptualizations within this RET and CBT model. And then you talk about errors in thinking and alternative interpretations can then be discussed. <clears throat> Along with some colleagues, I published an article back in 2016 um, where I thought that it was much more applicable to use a acceptance and commitment therapy model rather than a CBT model. Um, and as some of you know me, um, my focus um, in terms of my work has always been on chronic illness. So how do you live the good life when you're living with a disability is the real question. And one of the ways I've used well-being therapy with this population is to remind them, look, they're mourning the loss. Let's say someone survived a spinal cord injury or had a brain tumor. You mourn the loss. You didn't ask for the loss. It was unwanted. It happened without your vote. And it's sad that you can't do what you used to do. And that now you have to live with these limitations. Absolutely. But in the idea of balancing it, it's what do you still have? What are the values that are important to you? And given the limitations you're currently living with, how can you still live those values? So one example, um, I was working with an individual who um, sustained a spinal cord injury in a motor vehicle crash. And um, he was the father of a young um, son. And he said, now I can't be a dad because I can't throw the, you know, I can't play football, I can't play baseball. Um, and okay, so your value is, it's important for you to be um, in a, uh, a member of your family that can contribute to your son's growth and well being. Well, a football and baseball, are the only way is how else can you do it? How else can you teach them the things that you believe are important? How can you teach them how to treat other people? How can you treat them? Um, to have values and to live them um, in a way that's consistent with your family, your culture, your, your religion, right? And he realized that being a good dad <laughs> is not connected to the range of motion of your legs. It's what's in your heart and what you impart to your children. So to me, that's a whole act approach, but that's like a whole nother talk. I just wanted to introduce that there are other models that you can use um, if you want to do well-being therapy. So the key concepts of well-being therapy, no matter what um, approach you use to make it happen. So the goal of well-being therapy in general is you want to lead people from an impaired level of well being to an optimum level in the six dimensions of well being that are most applicable to them at this stage of their life. Even Giovanni, like many people who do CBT, and like you know this, the number of sessions are absolutely customized. There's, you know, for research, you had to do eight sessions. We said clinically, could be eight to 12, could be 15 sessions. You know, you work because some people are resistant. Some people have a hard time giving up um, the, um, the um, thoughts and feelings that are associated with um, depression. And um, it's hard for them to change the focus from eliminating the negative to engendering the positive. So <clears throat> that's the goal of well-being therapy is promotion of psychological well-being, not only the alleviation of distress. On the continuum, you want to be able to get them past zero. You don't only want to eliminate the negative, past zero and engender the positive. 
And whether you use ACT, whether you use um, CBT, RET, but following FAVA's general um, template um, is excellent data that shows that you can indeed increase uh, people's well being. And by the way, just as an aside, um, you can also do well being therapy on yourself. Um, so the CBT thing is well known to you. If you want to do an ACT thing, um, the question that um, I ask myself, as well as the people I work with, in the past week, in what ways has your behavior facilitated your ability to live your values? And in what ways has your behavior moved you away from living your values? because truth of the matter is we're all human and we're not perfect. And in some ways, some days, some hours, we do well, in some ways we fall short. So what are the values that are associated with each of Riff's dimensions? And I, I can go into that if there's time. Um, and I see that we do have a few minutes, so we'll continue. So, here are RIF's um, psychological well being factors. So, environmental mastery, and this is the template I used for people who have survived spinal cord injury. So, environmental mastery for them was knowing the easiest way I can get around, being creative about navigating obstacles, could easily delete that, and we could put in COVID, right? Are you comfortable um, going to unmasked? get togethers indoors? Um, um, are you comfortable, if you're on the other side, are you comfortable with people who wish to wear a mask? I know of a good, good, good close friend of mine who was in an Uber yesterday and the Uber driver, she, she wears masks um, religiously and the Uber driver refused. And when my friend asked the Uber driver if they could please wear a mask, the Uber driver blew up and threw her out of the car in a sketchy neighborhood, right? Welcome to COVID in 2022. Um, if you get invited to a get together, you get invited to a wedding. Um, and no matter where you are in terms of your beliefs about COVID, um, let's say that the people that are putting together the wedding party, ask you to be vaccinated, to show a vaccination card and to wear a mask. And you may have to take an airplane. Comfortable with that? Environmental mastery or getting away from COVID. Computers, right? Zooming. Today, I think went smoothly um, without technical glitches. What do you do if you're giving a webinar for, I don't know, 150 people and, uh, you know, your computer conks out? <laughs> it's happened, All right? Autonomy, knowing what you want and having the courage to act on that knowledge. Um, there's a lot of um, work being done on diversity issues, right? Let's say you have strong feelings about diversity issues. Are you comfortable? bringing up your opinions and what you believe strongly when situations go against them. Self-acceptance we talked about, knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at, knowing what you could be better at, knowing what eh, this is the way you is. And are you comfortable with all that? Purpose in life. What is your thing? What gets you out of bed? Making music, caring about other people, you know, um, learning something new. A positive relationships with others is pretty self-explanatory. Um, caring for other people, being a good friend, right? And then personal growth. In what ways are you different and more you than you were two years ago, three years ago, five years ago? But you, you get the general idea. And then what are the behaviors that you've engaged in over the past week um, that help you to live these values and support these critical factors in well-being? Um, 
So with that, um, I think we can stop sharing. And um, if there are questions, okay, so we'll look at the um, chat and <clears throat> oh, oh. there we go. So in the chat, um, yeah, go Badgers. <laughs> um, yes, I think Carlos will be able to email the slides, Hardy, uh, Heidi. Um, there it will be, there is a recording of the webinar. Dr. Perez, how are you? So uh, we will provide the recording. Uh, unfortunately, we do not forward slides. The next question that's come up is, is, has this been applied to adolescent populations? The answer is um, yes. Um, and you can look up um, on the web, well-being therapy with um, pediatrics, children, and adolescents. And again, there's been some really good um, data on it. Another question that's come up, a friend's stress is so high, she doesn't know how to take care, take the first step. What can I suggest? This is a great question because inherent in the question is um, when is the optimal time to engage in um, well-being therapy? Do you do it um, when people are extremely down in the dumps? Do you wait until they're in remission and until the medication and the, um, the evidence-based interventions work? Um, my own opinion in terms of that excellent question is that your friend is not ready for the positive psych stuff. Your friend um, is in pain. And um, you as a, a person who cares about them um, can help them to have hope. This will pass. I know it doesn't feel like it, doesn't look like it, but this will pass. And in the meantime, um, you know the database, the database um, for, um, for depression um, or anxiety um, is that the most efficacious interventions are um, good medications together with evidence-based um, therapy. But the, the okay. idea is to give them hope until the medication and the therapy can kick in, and then you could um, try some of the more positive approaches. Our next question is, what is the youngest age you would use this with? That's a really good question. I think it would be hard for kids under six um, just cognitively. Um, for the younger kids, um, I would do um, other things. There was stress reduction um, games that you could teach the younger children. You could teach them deep breathing. I had a question about PWQ. PWQ. We'll come back to that one. It might be the um, psychological well-being scale questionnaire. What is the email to request a PWQ? Ah, um, you can look up um, um, Carol Riff and the psychological well-being questionnaire. It's also been published, so it's free access. Do the books you shared earlier show uh, uh, on? Show us how to try this on ourselves. Yes. New recommendations on how to learn. Yes. Um, both books do that. They don't use well being, but it's much more of um, Leo Bamersky's book, as I mentioned. She goes over a summary of what we know, it does an excellent job explaining the biopsychosocial um, overlay through which we understand. Um, um, well-being. And then um, 
as I mentioned, the other two thirds of the book, she goes over 12 different evidence-based approaches that have been demonstrated to um, increase your well-being. And she does it beautifully. She says, nobody's going to like all of them. So if you try one, you don't like it, don't do it anymore. <laughs> try a different one. <laughs> and she gives you some pointers in how you might be able to pick a couple that are most applicable to you. Um, the other book by Shane Lopez gets into how you can increase hope in your own lives. Are there any differences in the efficacy of well-being therapy given in a group setting and individual setting? settings? Also a wonderful question that has not yet been fully answered by data. Um, uh, my buddy Fava does it individually. I've done it by groups. I've had some success doing it with groups. And in fact, the interchange, if the people have similar problems, is just wonderful in terms of the participants learning from each other. Do you think a patient of schizophrenia could benefit from CBT? Um, the data are that the answer is yes. It just has to be done um, in, in conjunction with the needs of the patient. So absolutely. Dr. Nuremberg, can you see a uh, question there on uh, an approach? EFT? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not as aware of the data on um, EFT. Um, my understanding third hand is that it has some excellent efficacy. But I, I just never got into it. So I, I'm not qualified to answer. Good question. Would this WBT approach work with people diagnosed with generalized anxiety? Ah, Fava and his colleagues have absolutely used it with anxiety. I just picked depression. Um, but I also, I highly recommend Fava's book on uh, well-being therapy. He really spells it out. Um, and by the way, the, <laughs> the way you might say, well, if he did this in 2004, why did, why did he wait till 2017 to publish it? Um, he was... He was really busy. Um, he's editor of a journal and he has an active clinical practice and he teaches. So he just never wrote it up. He was giving a talk on well-being therapy to a few hundred people. And one of his friends came up afterwards and said to him, Giovanni, you have to write the manual. He said, yeah, 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 it's on my list. Um, he said, no, no, you don't understand. You must write the manual now. Giovanni said, what's the rush? He's Italian. It's like, why do you have to do it? Um, and his friend said, because you didn't see who was in the audience. Judith Beck was in the audience taking copious notes. And if you don't do it, she's going to publish it. So he published that. <laughs> You're going to have to help me out with a word here. How do you apply the eudaimonic approach when working with members that have Substance use disorders, opiate addiction, op opiate use, alcohol with no prior history of sobriety. When do you know, when do you start? How do you know the member is ready to be, to explore purpose in life? Excellent question. Um, as some of you probably know, um, on our faculty here at NSU, um, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Christian Belusha, who's done a lot of work with AA. And he and I were talking once, um, and one of the things he's included um, into his uh, work is I encouraged him to put in well-being measures, because I said that if people who are addicted to alcohol achieve sobriety, um, they don't want to be sober. They want to be happy. And what have you done to help them be happy, right? So especially the idea that no matter what substance you happen to be addicted to, when you hit bottom, what's an alternative way that you can increase your well-being that's not going to kill you and ruin your life? So it's when they're ready to explore alternatives. That's when you could put this in. So I love this question. How can you convince a teenager into having a therapy, especially when they are full of anger? 
<laughs> well, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, some of you may know I started life as a pediatric psychologist and dealt with my, num and, and my own uh, uh, caseload of angry adolescents. And my, my favorite way of dealing with it is say, look, I would encourage the parents to say, look, your mom and I are very worried about you um, for a lot of different reasons. We are going to talk to a professional. It is our preference, our strong preference for you to be there when we talk about you. Because I'm sure there's some things we didn't do exactly right either. Um, so we really want you to be there. But if you don't want to be there, we're happy to go talk about you without you there. And we will be making some decisions about how this house is going to be run. We think you should have a say in that. But if you don't want to, don't. <laughs> Usually by then the teenagers will say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll come. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, concludes our questions. Uh, very insightful. Um, definitely, I need to add some of those books to my reading list myself. And I think, uh, I think the audience would appreciate them as well. So thank you for our, uh, the discussion. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting, getting a little message. You got a message there that BB says hi. So we're just- oh, wonderful. Say hi back. You know. So, Dr. Norbert, thank you again for your time. And if you're uh, for our audience, if you're interested in the recording, it will be posted the next business day on www.nova.edu forward slash shark chats.